nothing more as you listen to us that just focus on that breathing in and breathing out that that will do a lot to um, uh, counteract some of the things that we're going to be talking about because um, uh, my part of the presentation tonight is uh, maybe not as uplifting as some of the other parts because I'm going to be talking with you about stress and specifically the kind of stress that um, can be severe in the way that it affects our health, both our health of ourselves as well as our uh, children. And I'll talk to you about the, this, this term ACEs or adverse childhood experiences and its relationship with something that's called toxic stress that really is related to trauma as well. So that's, uh, and um, if, if there's anything that I'm uh, talking about that makes you uncomfortable, again, I invite you to go back to that breathing or, or get a drink of water, step out. I'll only be about 10 minutes and then uh, my colleagues will be taking over to talk about uh, some great strategies for parenting and, um, and taking care of yourself during this time as well. But the reason why we are beginning in this way is because um, adverse childhood experiences are highly stressful and traumatic events that happen in children's lives. Usually with, they occur in people under the age of 18. And the term really came about from a study that was conducted, a research study a number of decades ago, which really did confirm that um, certain kinds of adversities that happen during children's developing years really do have a lifelong effect on, on health. And so these were 10 types of adversities that um, were explored in the study. And the study included interviews with a very large uh, uh, group of adults asking them if, these, uh, if they had ever had these types of experiences, types of abuse, physical, emotional, or sexual, uh, other forms of neglect, be it emotional neglect or physical neglect, and then a, a range of household dysfunctions, possibly violence in the household, mental illness, um, and incarceration. And, um, and so these are the examples of the 10 categories of ACEs that the original study looked at. And then they correlated um, whether individuals said that they had experienced these to their health over their lifetime. And there were some things that came out of the study that were, were really kind of um, uh, revelations. And the biggest revelation was that how common um, these adversities were, these types of adversities across the whole population. In fact, most of us, uh, most of us adults have experienced at least one of these types of adversities over the course of our lives. And, um, and so that was a big, you know, aha that came out of this research of just how prevalent ACEs were across society. And the percentages that you're looking at now um, on this screen show you that across uh, the, the whole population, this is the percentage of adults who have experienced uh, substance abuse in their household when they were growing up. You'll see 27%. Um, physical abuse, 28%. And so this is just something to give you a sense of, of how prevalent um, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are. For every type of adversity that one may have experienced, that would be considered one ACE. And so um, one of the uh, other significant findings that came out of the research was the more types of ACEs uh, one experiences while they are growing up, the more um, the more types and the more prevalence of significant health issues that that individual or that that population would encounter. So there was this dose relationship where the more ACEs predicted more kinds of health problems. And when there is one ACE, there's usually uh, a, a, a related ACE as well. So if, there, if we've experienced one, there's a high likelihood that you may have had uh, at least another ACE or more. And so we talk about what are ACEs. And again, it's these experiences that include um, highly stressful events, whether it's um, uh, abuse, neglect, uh, uh, caregiver uh, in your immediate family that is suffering from um, other kinds of dysfunctions, be it mental illness, substance use disorders. And the more, again, the more of these kinds of experiences add up. But what's the connection to, to this thing called toxic stress? 
Well, we are wired as humans from the from even before birth. We are wired for relationships. So touch, faces, voices, these kinds of interactions are the basis for how our brains develop and how our bodies and our neurological system developed in a healthy way. And so that's the beauty of it, that we are wired to have these safe, supportive, and nurturing relationships. And when they happen, that really fuels our healthy development. But when that kind of safe, supportive, and nurturing uh, development is not there, it's not available, and there, a child may be experiencing periods of significant chaos or violence or stress in the home with, with their primary caregivers, then what happens is the body begins to produce uh, stress hormones. Um, and those hormones are cortisol and uh, and adrenaline. And when those hormones stay elevated in our systems, in a young child systems for significant periods of time, they can actually impair healthy development of the child's brain, of, of the healthy kind of nor normal development that children would experience as they grow. And so we see that there's this real connection between uh, our experiences and our environments. So we need to have this healthy root system of nurturing in our immediate family, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and this uh, to grow up in um, and develop in healthy ways. And so we've talked about ACEs and we've talked about toxic stress. Um, and then there's this, this term called trauma. And so, you know, when the, the term ACEs, when the original study was done, really just looked at 10 types of adversities. It, it didn't look at other kinds of experiences like bullying or other kinds of events that may have been um, experience of having a death in the family or someone that was very, very ill. And so these combination of um, stressful experiences and traumatic events be they significant and you know maybe occur once or be they more ongoing like verbal abuse um, all of those produce the effect of trauma and trauma is hurt it's a not just an emotional injury like you hurt my feelings but it is a real significant hurt that again um, impacts the healthy development of a child and so when we um, experience trauma, it, there's times when we are um, seeing that it, it shows in the ways that, um, that children play and in the ways that they relate with other children or in the ways that it might affect children's learning. And so I've just put a, a, a short list of the kinds of characteristics that sometimes um, uh, present when children have been growing up with a lot of stress and trauma in their in their situations. And when you look at these and you think about all of us as adults and the fact that 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 many of us have experienced ACEs in our life, when we think about self-regulation and low frustration tolerance and aggression, you know, those of us who may have had some trauma or history in our growing up. Um, at this time during COVID, when it's extremely stressful, we may be finding that some of our historical trauma, our trauma that we may have experienced, um, may be, we may be more easily triggered as well at this time. But the good news is that um, while relationships are, are so important, and we talked about um, when adverse experiences happen in children's relationships with their caregivers, the the reverse of that is true as well, that when we have these uh, supportive and caring and nurturing relationships happening uh, around us and with us, they can do so much to mitigate that stress that occurs uh, from uh, the adversity and the traumatic experiences. And so it's really, I like to think of it as we kind of build these circles of care around ourselves, 
but and our families, but also around our children too. And and so what is that circle of care? Well, it's 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 several adults that that can provide that safety and that concrete support when help is needed. And that's for our children, but it's also for us as their parents uh, in making sure that we have a strong circle of care as well. And so part of that, when children are growing up, they want to feel safe and supportive. They want to feel as if they matter and that they're, they uh, belong and that there is this sense of healthy attachment, which means, and you can see in this picture how this, um, this grown up is really attending to this child and this child feels safe and supportive and knows that that grown up is there and caring about them. And so that's uh, a big piece of the ways that we build resilience that, that counter kind of, um, counteracts some of the uh, stress that we may um, otherwise be experiencing just in normal everyday life. I thought I put this, um, this is a little um, infograph that's circulating on Facebook right now. Some of you may have seen it, but um, I was thinking about COVID and this period that we're in right now. And this is just one example of the many ways that um, this was mothering, so that mothers are just feeling maxed out. And, and so, um, I'll be, I'll be um, turning this conversation over to uh, Michelle next, and she's going to be talking with you much, much more about caring for your children really begins with caring for yourself, too, and that's so important. And so these are just some suggestions as we kind of think about straight, uh, this kind of severe stress, our own tendency perhaps to have some triggers happening, um, some coping challenges that we ourselves may be facing, to be mindful of that, um, to maybe be mindful of uh, any sort of negative self-talk we may have going on in our own minds and to think about what might be underneath that. Um, and then I want to leave you with this awesome resource, mhascreening.org. It's a www. And um, I've spent several days just in just really, really enjoying the resources, um, you know, in my dealing with my own experience now during COVID with all kinds of resources to just help be in tune with the feelings that I'm having, understand my worries and are these worries just worries or are they getting to be more like anxiety worries? And so it's an awesome resource. It has screens, it has tools for parents. And I'll leave you with just this one tool that I thought was helpful. That's a, the acronym is there's the path to calm, pause. Again, let's breathe, maybe get a drink of water. It, acknowledge that we are feeling things right now. Sometimes we get wrapped up in the busyness of taking care of others and all the responsibilities that we have and we forget to acknowledge our own feelings. And then think about what might be happening and most of all, uh, take action to reach out to someone that we trust. Again, making sure that we're building that circle of care around us. So I hope that I've um, uh, given you some things to think about and I'd like to turn it over to our next speaker, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And so now we're going to have Michelle and she is going to come on and talk about parents and how they can um, engage in practices of self care. So go ahead and take it over Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. It might help if I unmute myself before I start talking, huh? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I don't think there is anyone, any one of us whose schedule hasn't been dismantled and which can become a real breeding ground for stress. And I want everyone to just remember that this is tempor temporary and by focusing on some of your own self-care, I hope you'll be able to relax and breathe a little easier about life. <clears throat> uh oh, nice. There we go. Um, to talk about self-care, let's first talk about the four aspects of self. Um, I am also an Anishinaabe citizen. I'm Ojibwe from Wisconsin. And the wisdom shared here is some that's been passed down through elders in our culture. And it's kind of a fancy medicine wheel, which is a teaching tool that helps us live well and balanced. 
And the elders remind us that in order to live well, we have to pay attention to and understand that every person has four aspects to self. You have your physical self, emotional self, intellectual, and spiritual self. None are more important than the other and all have an equal part in this balanced wheel. As you can see those in the center with the feathers and the four colors, that's all balanced and everything is equal. When we aren't well or sick or struggling, we need to take stock of what is happening with these aspects and do what we can to bring them back into balance. So for example, we may be feeling more emotionally lately um, and realize that we have been less physically active. So this, through the wheel, this throws the wheel out of balance. So to bring balance, we need to do have more movement or add exercise to our day. Maybe we've been doing a lot of reading or seeing a lot or hearing a lot right now about COVID and the only and that's the only conversation you've had. Um, so having a conversation with another adult or going to a trusted source can bring back our intellectual side and, and give us that balance that we need when we're low. <clears throat> you want to ask yourself, what kinds of things can you do to balance your health using these aspects as a guide? And these are just some of my favorite things um, that, that, that bring that piece to me. Um, okay, so everyone reacts different to stress and stressful situations. There's no right or wrong way, but there are healthy ways to respond. Um, it's a good reminder, but sometimes we need a little bit more. You may be saying, I just can't get motivated to exercise without the gym, or kids are bored and fighting, and I just can't get a break. I'm trying to keep up with work at home, the media, whatever. I'm, there's a lot of things to worry about that are a breeding ground for stress. So first know that we're all in this together and it's okay to reach out to others for help. There are many organizations working to provide support around us, restaurants, there's pop-up community food banks, um, telehealth services that are waiving co-pays. So feel free to reach out and, and get the support that you need. Um, also remember everyone acts different. And so, you know, take one day at a time and that's being mindful. Don't get too far into the future because that's when we start to worry about things that 99% of the time may never happen. Take time to play and don't rush. Being mindful means being in the moment. It's easier said than done, but it can save us a lot of worry in the long run. Acknowledge your strengths and arouse your senses. Do what you're good at. And if you can try something new that you can work, that you can work to be good at, then that's even better. Um, and it could be something simple. Maybe you're the best paper plane airplane, maybe you're the best paper airplane maker in your house, or um, you've had time to clean out clutter and found things that you forgot about that you could pick up and you know become good at again. Um, do things that arouse your senses. Remember, we have five of them. There's touch, smell, sound, sight, and hearing. So your self-care might be to adjust your environment and try to ignite as one or as many of those senses as you can. Aromatherapy is a very powerful tool in that. Um, one of the things I've been doing at home during all, the, all of this is boiling cedar on a pot. You can take a palm size full of cedar leaves or even pine needles and put them in a huge pot of water and let them boil down. That smell, not only will, you know, is like aromatherapy for the brain and, and create some calming, but it, it also can kill bacteria and viruses in the air. Not necessarily COVID, but it can kill, um, you know, it can create that healthy air space for you. Um, you can also take a bath in it and kids can soak in it. It's, it's just all around good medicine that's right outside your door. So let yourself be playful. Um, play or make up new games. Take these themed hikes. A lot of us have time to go outside to walk, which is a good thing to do. Maybe do a silent hike or flip a penny. And depending on which way the penny turns, you might turn left or right and explore new, new places around you. Um, the third aspect here is to forgive. We're always our worst, own worst enemies and no one is perfect. Um, Adam Osborne said, the most valuable thing you can make is a mistake. You can't learn anything from being perfect. Mistakes are your proof that you're trying. So um, you're, not, you're not your mistakes and you're not your struggles. You're right here, right now, and, and you have the power to shape your, your day or even your evening. Um, and then finally, practice acceptance. That does not mean wanting or wishing or approving of something, 
but it means acknowledging the experience and feeling it, not smothering it or reacting to it, but allowing yourself to feel it. Be angry if you need to, but take a breath and think about your reaction. Be cautious of going on autopilot and take a mindful check-in and notice how your body's feeling. Look at what judgments you're making about the experience and practice letting go of that judgment. There's a strong body-mind connection, as Allison already mentioned, in all of us. Um, when we talk about interferences to self-care, um, often those include time and space. Inevitably coming up with um, some of those ideas, um, we'd have to look a little bit deeper at our brains. And so um, caring for our brain is also self-care. So this particular, these eight steps for caring for your brain came out of a magazine called Mindful. There's the, the notation down below there, but it was a great little article by Linda Graham, who is also the author of a book called Resilience, Power Practices for Bouncing Back from Difficult, Disappointing, and Difficult and difficulty and even disaster. A great, a great little read. Um, but a few things, um, again, Allison touched on some of them, and I know Mary's gonna touch on other, but a few things, you know, exercise can reduce, can, can reduce anxiety. Sleep is when our bodies recover and repair. So it also is a time for our metabolisms to reset. So cleaning out dead neurons, it's, it's something that we all need and may have some trouble with. So again, arousing your senses and then coming to a, a calm state using your breathing is, is good self-care for you. Um, eating a mindful diet, making sure it's dense and nutrient, um, a nutrient dense, sorry, I'm getting all tongue tied. <laughs> um, our brains learn and rewire itself all the time. It's some new, something new that many of us when we were younger didn't, the brain research wasn't where it is today. And so um, the nice thing about making mistakes, the nice thing about the stress that comes and hits us is that we can reverse um, you know, the trauma and, and all of the negative things that we've done just by learning how to relax and take care of ourselves. So be creative, laugh out loud. Laughing is contagious and it can quickly shift somebody's mood to another state. Um, and then hang out with other brain, other healthy brains. There's people in your life who may be good at something or you know, maybe have some great recipes to try. Call on those people and, and um, you know, tap into their, into their wisdom and, and share what you're good at. Um, technology right now is probably bombarding many of our senses more so than usual. Um, and it's very energy consuming um, and, and really can draw, it can really overstimulate us in a way that actually is detrimental to our attention and ability to focus. So if you're finding you're spending more time online for news and reading social media, set some limits and give yourself a break in each day. If you go online for your news, consider your sources and go to credible places to check your facts. Your local news um, or even your favorite personalities on the news may not always be the best source, um, so, you know, always, always do your own fact checking when you can. Um, even if they're your favorite, they could be getting conflicting information themselves. And sometimes if we're tired, we might mis misinterpret those things. Um, for me and the work that we're doing, we rely a lot on the Centers for Disease Control. You can kind of um, see up here this website, they have a lot of good information. So even some of the social media and some of the reporting that I've been seeing where they've quoted CDC or said the CDC was wrong or offering conflicting information, if you go right to the source, sometimes you find that's not always the case. It's just a matter of somebody misinterpreted what was said. And so I always suggest when something's got you stressed out, go to the source and, and find out for yourself. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the slide, but I wanted to share it um, because conscious discipline, in the work that I do, um, we use conscious discipline as an approach with many of the communities. Um, I'm an educator, I also work in health. So a lot of our health providers, Head Start staff, home visitors, and many of our parents that we're working with um, have been doing a lot of work around conscious discipline. And right now they have some fantastic resources for parents and for children. And you can kind of see here, um, there's a number of freebies. You, there are some aspects of the site where you have to pay, but others that are free. So please check that out. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Um, in the conscious discipline, they talk about the three brain states and Allison touched a bit on this. So our brains have three states of functioning. There's 
three main states of functioning. There is the executive state, which is what can I learn? And that's where we can have normal conversations and think reasonably. And then we have our emotional state where you can see in that blue area there. And that's where, you know, when, you know, all behavior is purposeful. So what is that purpose? What is it that somebody's trying to tell me by their behavior? And at the core of it, and especially for children and even ourselves, we want to make sure that we're loved. And if we're not, or if we're not sure that that's the case, or we feel like we're in danger, that's where we go into the survival state of the brain. And that's where our brain is asking, am I safe? And it's going to react in a way where we'll feel it in our body. We'll feel uncomfortable. When we move into emotional state, we're moving away from the reasoning part of our brain. So we need to help we need to learn to regulate ourselves and shift through these brain states through our own actions and words because the better we are at regulating ourselves the better our kids will become and that doesn't mean stifling your feelings but acknowledging them and naming them by understanding what it feels like when our own body when we're happy or sad that's being mindful our stress and the perception of of the perception we have around a situation or with somebody that is intertwined with judgments may may cause us to may cause may push buttons in us that cause those triggers that Allison kind of talked about. So the first power I want to give you before I close out here in just a few seconds is that no one can make you angry without your permission. So let me give you a quick perception. Things don't make us angry. Things trigger us or push our buttons. We often guard ourselves from from most people and so our connections outside build connections inside. You may feel like it's easier to let your guard down with certain people um, rather than others, but our triggers are actually our wounds from our childhood that Allison talked about. So in some cases, the triggers have been passed down. So the question becomes, do you want to hand down that trigger again? And if not, instead of reacting, you know, with, with um, some emotional response, you're driving me nuts. You don't, you know, don't make me send you to my, to your room or why'd you hit her? I'm going to take a few deep breaths, calm down, and then talk to you. And if I don't like something in society, I can bring it home, change it in myself, teach others, or model it for others, and thus become that change. So here's the skill. The, the skill that I would like to share with you, this act of calming on this slide here, I know Mary's going to touch a little bit on it, so we'll come back to that. But basically, the goal when we're triggered is to achieve composure. So through active calming, when we're upset, we can take three basic steps, which is the star breathing, and we'll come back to that, to reassure, reassure yourself while you're doing that slow breathing, I am safe, keep breathing, I can handle this. That's that positive self-talk that Allison talked about. So as you breathe, I am safe, keep breathing, I can handle this, and slow things down. And then wish well, you put your hands over your heart, and wishing well is, seen, is being able to see the preciousness, preciousness in others. But this movement, that body-mind connection, also gives you that sense of where your heart is and how it's slowing down. And with open hands, you open your heart up to the other person. And so open hands, open minds, you can show somebody that sincerity when you need that time to calm and compose yourself. Then those are some actions you can stay, uh, you can take. Um, I think the biggest thing is to be kind to ourselves. Um, practice mind mindfulness outdoor in outdoor settings. There's a lot of research about how much more effective we can be in the outdoor settings in reducing anxiety and depression. We have better focus, better physical health, and there's a lot of really cool research about the effervescence that trees put off that actually affect us in more than just a physical way. So um, this calendar is something that's kind of fun. I just kind of threw it in there for everyone. If you are interested in more on conscious discipline, this is just one of the free downloads you can get from there. But the last thing about shifting the brain and self-care that I want to share with you today is remember the mirror neurons. Those are those little ones in your brain that we can catch from other people. So remember to smile. We catch emotions from other people and we'll download them. So sharing a smile with others can be very pow powerful for changing someone else's mood. Um, and the most important part of self-care is practice. Make time to do it. Um, set up a safe place in your home or outside or somewhere for yourself and your children where you can practice self-regulation. 
could be a little sitting, sitting area with a pillow or a chair and a candle or a book of inspirations, calming music, whatever. But it's not a place of consequence or punishment like the old timeout chairs, just the place with visuals and soothing things to help one practice regain and maintain your composure. Um, so with that, I want to close out. I apologize if I took too much time there and look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate that. Um, so that was our second of today's topics. Uh, and so now we're going to um, have Mary Manor join us and talk more about how parents can help their children cope. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mary, and I'm with Five to One. Some of you may be familiar with Five to One as um, uh, playgroups and neighborhood centers and uh, our Facebook page. So, um, I want to, uh, first of all, I'm grateful to the, the two presenters who came before because they really set up uh, well what we're going to talk about right now, which is some strategies for parenting that will support your children during this time of stress. Um, I want to start out just by telling you what we believe about every parent, and we believe this about you. You're an expert on your child. You know your child better than anyone else. And you bring special strengths, unique strengths to your parenting that no one else can. You do as well as you can by your child. We know that that, that is important to you. And you also are uniquely able to bring critical insights and information to your child's development. So at every developmental stage, you are there with the right information to help your child move on. We also know that uh, parents have ambivalent feelings about parenting. Sometimes they feel, um, as we, we've all felt, that we just don't know what we're doing and we're terrible parents and, you know, why did we ever have children? Um, everyone feels that way and it's completely normal because parenting is a process that's built on trial and error. We don't know what the future will bring. We can't be ready for every, everything that we might face. And certainly, um, I don't think that we were ready for uh, the situation that we are facing now. So um, just keeping in mind that you are an expert and you have strengths that no one else has to support your child. So the best way to support children is to build those core capabilities in the adults who care for them. And uh, science tells us that no matter what may have happened before in our lives, it's never too late to develop and strengthen our core capabilities. So those core capabilities are really you know, fall into two different categories. And one is self-regulation, which you've heard a little bit about already. And the other is executive function. When we talk about self-regulation, we're really talking about at least two different kinds of self-regulation. One is the, um, the kind of automatic regulation that happens that your, your body takes care of for you. Uh, if you're frightened, if you hear loud, loud noise, if you are, if you feel in, that you're in danger, that kind of automatic um, response to a stimulus is uh, conditioned to some extent by the things that happen to us when we're young. So for children who have experienced a great deal of uh, unmitigated toxic stress in early childhood, their tendency is to overreact and kind of live in that automatic response mode. Executive function, that's that higher order brain function, that's that uh, our capacity to learn and reflect and to measure our response to things. So this is, um, this is that part of the brain that uh, is, is where we problem solve and where we learn to collaborate. 
And it's also the part of the brain that is most susceptible to stress. So when we are feeling stressed, when we are, um, when we are worried, when we have anxieties, it actually makes, us hard, makes it harder for us to think. And we have a harder time then with self-regulation of the more thoughtful, calm type. But we can strengthen these capabilities in ourselves. And when we do that, we actually are modeling for our children how they can develop those same capabilities. The other part of supporting children during difficult times is to be a responsive caregiver. And by that, I mean being present with children. It doesn't mean uh, being at, at their beck and call 24 seven. It means that you are present with them, that you are making eye contact and that you are responding to their questions in a way that lets them know that you're paying attention even though you may be feeling very stressed and, and very challenged. So some practical advice. And I wanna start with something called serve and return, which sounds like a game and in a way it is, but it's absolutely fundamental for building children's brains. And most of these pictures show um, young children, but I'll, I'll tell you that this actually works with kids of any age. So the first thing, this is the serve. A child notices something. When you notice the same thing with them, you are validating that child. You are saying, oh, wow, look, you saw something. You're important. I want to see what you see because if it's important to you, it's important to me. This strengthens your bond with the child and it really helps build their self-esteem. Now the ball is in your court to return something. So what are you noticing? By validating your child's curiosity, you're helping them learn to, how to explore their world. And once again, you're reminding them that you value what they think you value what they value. And these are incredibly important um, attributes for a child to begin to believe that, oh, I have something to offer the world. Give it a name. So help your, help your children build a vocabulary that helps them describe the world that they're seeing and helps them describe what they're thinking about it. This is the critical part. The critical part is taking turns and waiting. So you wanna, you wanna bounce that ball back and forth um, for everything that, a, for every time that a child gives you, serves you something, you wanna be ready to respond back, but you also wanna wait and you wanna make sure that you're giving your child an opportunity to explore deeply in whatever is interesting them. And you also want to make sure that you're observant during this time because you will see things, you will learn things about your child and what interests them, and you'll learn things about what they're good at and also maybe what they struggle with that you wouldn't necessarily see if you kind of rush, uh, try to rush through a given activity. And finally, the fifth step is practicing ending. And this is really a crucial issue for kids. And it's actually kind of hard for some of us adults too, to be able to end something and make a transition into a new activity. That's actually a, a part of that development of executive function that lets us know, oh, we need to, um, you know, we need to be mindful of the time, for example, and keep moving and not uh, not stay with a given activity too long, or I'm so interested in this that I don't want, I'm willing to give up other things in order to stick with it. In both cases, those are tremendously important things for kids to learn and be able to moderate for themselves. So that's serve and return. Another thing that's incredibly important and helpful right now is to bring the arts into, um, into your life and into your children's lives. 
because it's through the arts that we're able to explore feelings that we might not have words for and to think about situations that we may never have experienced but we were worried about. There's a great kids book that you can download from Zero to Thrive. Uh, it was written by some folks at the U of M and it, it's the story of Georgie and the giant germ. It's the story of a, of a little boy who um, is trying to figure out what the deal is with coronavirus. And what I love about this book is that um, it illustrates so many of the things that we know are happening with kids, but it's but that are really hard to hard to have conversations about. So kids are really curious, and they ask a lot of questions, and they pick up right away if you are not giving them a straight answer, or if you're worried, or if your mood is is um, is not is is concerning. And they start to worry about things that we would never worry about because they connect events very differently. They don't understand cause and effect in the same way. And oftentimes kids figure out that it must be their fault that their caregivers in a bad mood or is feeling anxious. It's really hard to address these things straight on, but it's a lot easier to do it through um, through the arts, through drawing, through dance, through music, in this case, through reading a story and potentially um, coloring it. So um, touch is really important, and you already heard that from both of our previous speakers. And, and the cruel part about our situation is that we're being, you know, we're being asked to be socially distant. If you're sheltering together, presumably you can be physical. So you can give hugs, you can hold hands, you can give gentle massage. But um, as Michelle pointed out, we have these, uh, these special neurons called mirror neurons. If you look at someone and they move, neurons in your own brain will fire the same. So actually watching someone move around um, is kind of like moving with them. So one thing that you can do if you do need to maintain some kind of social distance is to play together with a, a safe distance and watch each other play. It's almost like physically touching. The other kind of touch that's really important is the emotional touch. And I don't know if you um, in your family maybe have a special gesture or a word or something that um, is just your little way of communicating, I love you, I care about you. Um, I don't know if uh, maybe you remember Carol Burnett. Uh, she had a variety show on TV and she always ended the show by tugging on her earlobe, which was a little signal that she learned from her grandmother that meant I love you. Come up with something like that with your family. Create some something that's special in your family for right now so that at any time you can just send a little, a little message of love and emotional connection to your children without saying it. Um, emotional touching is the same thing as being present. It's when somebody knows that they're being listened to and they're being paid attention to. And it is so important for children who um, really feel a lot of stress if they feel they're being ignored. And that can actually be, uh, during this particular time, can, can really create a, a toxic stress situation for kids. So being present and making that emotional connection um, is super important. And so now I've come to the end, I'm gonna invite Michelle to come back because we wanna talk about breathing. Some of you have probably taken uh, mindfulness classes or maybe you've taken yoga classes and um, you know that you pay a lot of attention to breathing. We do the same thing with children. We, um, we've been doing virtual playgroups and we always end our playgroups with this 
breathing series. So Michelle, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So on this is another one of the, the techniques or the approaches that you'll find in conscious discipline as well. There should be a download somewhere on that site there. But the very first one is the star. And the star reminds us to smile, take a breath, and relax and breathe. And remember, as you do that, you, you, you have that positive self-talk that I can handle this. I'm okay. I'm safe. And just let that breath out. And you're going to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth slowly and let that positive self-talk just move through you until you're calm. And then the next one is just a, so all four, all four of these are just different forms of the same type of thing. So with the drain, what you're going to want to do, and again, remember body mind connection, you're going to hold your hands out in front of you. You probably can't see my, my screen all that well, but you hold your hands stiff right in front of you and make fists as tight as you can. You're going to tense up everything. And then as you extend out your arms, like faucets, tighten all your muscles, then relax, let your shoulders fall. After you've taken your breath in, you relax. And as you breathe out, you let your shoulders fall. You let your hands relax and open up the faucet so that the water can fall. That's letting all the tension drain away. The next one is the balloon. So you make that balloon over your head, like a big sunshine over your head. And you're gonna breathe in through your nose and just And then when the balloon pops, then you let your arms open up and you let that breath out and drop your arms all the way down, just like the balloon falling to the ground. And then the pretzel, this one's a little more complicated to do by Zoom, but you're gonna cross your ankles. You're gonna stand up in a, in a straight position. You're gonna cross your ankles, so one leg over the other as you're standing carefully, both feet flat on the ground. You're gonna cross your, your wrists. So the way that I do this, if you can see my screen, is you're going to hold your hands straight out in front of you and clap and miss. So now the back of your hands are touching and you're gonna fold your arms into your chest and you can touch, touch your chin with, with your thumb, if you can do that. And so this crossing your body over different parts from left to right and up to down, this crossing also releases some good neurons in your brain and helps your, your body re recharge. And so after you've gotten into this position, you're gonna feel all tight again and you're gonna take a brief, deep breath in in your chest and then let it all relax. So you're gonna unwind as you let that breath out and un uncross your legs and come back to that standing position. So which all of these are fun to do for kids, but they're also just as important for us. And if you're into yoga, you'll recognize some of these moves as well. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. So. Okay. Well, I, my screen seems to be frozen, so I can't get to my last slide. Well, anyway, I'll just tell you what was on it. On the last slide, I'm just telling you what you've already heard. We're all in this together, and that's how we're going to get through this together. If you um, would like to reach out to other parents, I invite you to go to our Facebook page, um, 5 to 1 Neighborhood Network, and um, then you, you can uh, connect with us there and find out about events and activities that are going on virtually and um, some things that are happening around the, the region that you can go to in person and, of course, connect with other parents. So thanks very much. Great. Well, thank you, Mary and Michelle and Allison. Um, I, I think right now we have some time for some questions. That there were no that came were none that came up in our our Q and A box. Uh, but if you have some questions and would like to share them in the chat box, uh, we can relay those to uh, any of the presenters at this point. Um, Just waiting to see what, what you might have, what's on your mind. And I know one thing that I didn't think about um, 
that uh, came from uh, Michelle's presentation was, was the idea of arousing your senses and um, doing some aromatherapy or, or putting some cedar in, in a boiling pot. Um, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, we're used to it's kind of just kind of the same old senses and the, the same old things uh, in our in our homes and, and doing something as simple as that. Um, seems like it could make a profound, profound difference. It's a nice way to bring a little bit of the outdoors in when you have the yucky colder days or it's raining as well. That is true, which we've had plenty of recently. It hasn't felt like spring, <laughs> or at least May recently. Um, I also like the thought, I, I think this was, was also from Michelle's, was the idea that when we're, we're triggered, the goal is, is to achieve composure. And I think Mary went through um, a lot of nice ways to, to really um, slow ourselves down as well. Um, well. Actually, Michelle did that as well. Um, but Mary was talking about this, this whole process. Uh, I, I feel, you know, we, we don't often see parenting as a process. We see it as, you know, something right in the moment and, and trying to bring ourselves out of that, that immediate moment can be hard. Um, but I, I think that the serve and return pattern, which is something that I, I hadn't heard before, but makes a whole lot of sense in, in developing strong relationships with our kids um, is, is powerful. It looks like we might. Oh, thank you. Well, it doesn't look like we have any any more questions right now. Um, everyone who has attended and who has signed up for uh, this this webinar, uh, you will receive an email tomorrow um, with a link to all of the resources and, as well as the survey uh, for that we would like to, we would like to hear more from you about how the webinar went. Um, so please take some time and fill the, that out with us. Survey will only take about five or six minutes. They're mostly drop down questions or checkbox questions. So that would really be a big help to us to help us know whether you would like to hear more um, on these topics or. Um, uh, or have longer times or have these at another time. Um, since it's our first try, we're, we're just getting, getting the hang of this. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, I would like to thank our pre presenters, Allison Arnold, Mary Manor, and Michelle Schultz for uh, these great presentations and these great ideas to help us as parents move forward in these uncertain times. Um, I, I wish you all the best of night, and um, I hope you all stay well. Thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Wish you well. Thank you. Oh, I also want to mention that this, this presentation will be posted on Facebook. Um, and if you, you registered, you will also get a copy of the, the program uh, in your email tomorrow as well. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great night and stay well. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care.